conservation agriculture is a sustainable uh, means of, of farming. It, it allows a farmer to have a farm for passing on to his son, passing on to his grandchildren. You know, we have areas around Arusha which are severely eroded, where whole farms have just been washed away. You know, the best evidence of the problem with conventional farming is to look at the, the rivers in the rainy season. The rivers tend to run brown or, or red, depending on the type of soil that's being washed into the rivers. And that soil ends up in Lake Victoria or Lake Tanganyika or into the Indian Ocean. So it's, we consider it Tanzania's biggest export is its soil. So that's what we're trying to fix. Minimum tillage will help us stop soil erosion because coupled with minimum tillage, we, we try and leave a cover on the soil surface. The plough tends to invert the soil profile, whereas we just loosen the soil on the line and the crop residues from the previous crop are left on the soil surface. So when you have the heavy rains that we do in Tanzania, it doesn't really rain, it pours. We can get 50 millimetres in half an hour. Half of that rainfall tends to run off where you have a ploughed field. But where we do minimum tillage and we have a cover on the soil, most of that water will penetrate the soil, it will infiltrate. And then between rainfall events, the soil moisture that is in that field evaporates less. So within a season, we are, we are getting much less soil erosion, which is the fertility is retained. And we're also getting more moisture to see the crop through. Tanzania is famous for its mid-season droughts. We get long dry periods in the middle of, of a crop. And with conservation agriculture, we have more moisture to, to produce a better yield. If we compare a farmer who's doing ploughing and doing everything else right, so he plants at the right time, he does weeding and really manages that crop with insecticides well. He can get between six and 10 cotton fruits per plant. With conservation agriculture, where we also use fertilizers and herbicides, we can get 20 to 30 bowls per plant. So, you know, we, we're doubling, tripling, even getting fivefold increases in yield using this farming method. Important is to rotate the cotton, which is a cash, cash crop. We rotate it with a food crop. And in this part of the world, the cash crop is maize. So we, we're having an income from, from two streams. But the farmer will first feed his family with his maize crop. His surplus, under conservation agriculture, we get much higher yields. He will then sell that. Then he has money to support, um, obviously, school fees and those things. But then he's also getting a good income from his, his cotton. This conservation agriculture project is linked very strongly to the conservation farming project. Because the biggest challenge to getting this technology adopted is the cost of this technology. The farmers are very poor. And the real catalyst to getting it adopted is access to, to the credit for the inputs. Under conservation farming, a group of farmers have a contract with a ginning company. The ginning company wants their seed cotton as part of that contract and in return the ginning company will provide them the inputs for farming. We are hoping that once all the people involved, the, the stakeholders in cotton, think this is a good idea, then the ginners will start supplying the inputs we need for conservation agriculture to the farmer. The main principles to, to growing a good cotton crop is to plant it on time. In the West, the optimum planting time for cotton is the, is the middle of November. If they can get the crop in in middle of November, they will get a very good yield if they do weeding and all those other things correctly. If they plant a month later, for every day they delay in planting, they can lose 1% of yield. So if you plant middle of December, you can, you're already losing about 30% of yield. So the very important thing is to have your land prepared in time and to plant on time. And then another big challenge is to do proper weeding. Also, we, we need to have the right plant population density in this field. So under our system, we, we plant rows 90 centimeters apart. And within the row, we'll have plants 40 centimeters apart. And we have two plants coming up every 
40 centimeters. So those are, are critical things. And then obviously um, at about week eight after planting, the insects start building up. So, you know, he's done all that hard work. He's weeded, he's gap filled, he's got a well-established crop, but now he needs to start looking after the insects. So that is critical. We have um, three main insects. We will have bollworm attacking the fruits. We will get aphids later on. Aphids are very damaging. They're sucking insects. They'll suck energy out of the plant, but they produce a honeydew that falls on the lint. And it, it, um, a fungus will then grow on that and, and stain this cotton a black color. And we also have an insect called a cotton stainer. We have a, a system called integrated pest management, where we are trying to move away from just using chemicals to control insects and weeds. So it's, it's, uh, holistically, it's an integrated crop management. Cotton insect pests have predators. Other insects like parasitic wasps, ladybirds, which will take out um, aphids, parasitic wasp will take out the larvae or bollworm. So we are looking at systems and softer chemicals to, to try and preserve the predators. One of the challenges we have faced is grazing by livestock of the, the crop residues and the cover we're trying to build up on the soil. This is a, a huge problem and one way of addressing the grazing, free grazing by livestock is to get the farmers to put living fences around their farms. Living fences could be something like sisal, which has a very sharp point, or we, we think of jatropha. It is a crop which grows as a hedge. Um, a hedge that is managed very well can produce about two kilograms of, of seed, and that is a very oil-rich seed. It has about 42% oil in it. If you think of sunflower, jatropha, much higher yielding than sunflower, that seed gets crushed, oil is extracted, and that then has a market value. It can be turned into many different products, soaps, but one of the big things the world is interested in is biofuels. Jatropha has that value, and we've done calculations that the average farmer, if he fences his farm, he can get a return equal to about three quarters of an acre of cotton, good yielding cotton. That's a perennial hedge. He doesn't have to do anything to it once it's established besides pick up the seeds and then sell them in the village. There's a company in Arusha which will come and buy that seed, gets crushed in Arusha and turned into biofuels. Um, so we believe we have a hedging, a fencing solution to stop free grazing by cattle, that also gives the farmer a return on investment. And it's a green fuel, which is very good for the environment as well. It's a, it's a carbon neutral fuel, basically. And the world is, is crazy about biofuels. So it's an appropriate technology to these farmers. Gatsby's um, involvement here is, is funding the demonstrations for possibly six years. So this project has been going for four years already. The first three years of the project was doing research. We were operating all over Tanzania, um, seeing what methods of conservation agriculture are appropriate to a particular region. So Gatsby's involvement has been right from the start and they will carry on possibly for another four years as we scale up this technology. During the first phase of this project, we had up to 250 demonstration plot pairs where we have cotton and maize side by side and we try and locate those along the road so the strategy for dissemination is to advertise what we're doing so we need these demonstrations so farmers can see what we're doing this coming season we are now starting to target the lead farmers there will be 2,000 of those eventually we are targeting this year 830 of them so those lead farmers, we'll bring them to a training venue, we'll train them in this method of farming, but then they'll take those inputs back to their village, they'll select one of their farmers and plant this demonstration among them. So it's, it's about demonstration is the number one tool. But then it's to, to make sure that the farmers, once they want to do this technology, they have access to the inputs. So we are working very closely with the input suppliers, and then we're also working with the agricultural machinery suppliers, particularly those that make 
animal traction equipment. So, that, you know, the farmer is not just going to see a beautiful demonstration plot. He's going to realize I can actually do that myself because the equipment's available and through the farmer Jinnah contract under contract farming, he can then get the inputs to do this. But it's a matter of convincing all the role players and, and getting everybody to work as a team. Everywhere else in Africa, people are working, people like myself work with individual farmers, but here we're going to have groups and three groups will elect one lead farmer. So it's a matter of leverage. You work with one lead farmer, <coughs> you reach about 300 farmers. So just by targeting that one man, we, we can spread this idea very quickly. In the next two to three years, we are going to reach all the lead farmers. So this coming season, we'll have 830 of these demonstrations with the lead farmers. Then the next year, we'll double that. And then three years from now, we'll have reached all 2,000 lead farmers. So through them, we should reach all 400,000 uh, cotton farmers in Tanzania. You know, this project's goal is to at least double the, the cotton yields. So besides having more cotton at the ginner level, he'll be very happy. The ginning company owner will be happy. But the farmer is also making good money out of this. His cash crop, we have found if we, if we compare farmer practice economics with conservation agriculture, using all the expensive inputs I've mentioned, the farmer makes a gross margin of 50% better than the conventional farmer. Now a gross margin is where you take the return, in other words when this crop is harvested you calculate what that value is and then you subtract from that all the costs, labor, fertilizers, whatever to achieve this crop. The net figure is your gross margin. That's your profit. That's the money you put in your back pocket and the farmers doing this are making 50% more money. And they're also getting a bigger yield, so they've got more crop and they've got more money. Yeah, I'm passionate about this. It's, it's um, been basically about 20 years at least of my life. Well, sorry, more. Um, I've had 18 years of research doing this and now 10 years, so it's 28 years. And uh, it's, it's really something that um, I believe can make a difference in Africa. It's going to stop the soil erosion and it's going to help mitigate against climate change. Everybody's speaking about climate change. And in this part of the world, it's going to mean less rainfall. And conservation agriculture keeps more moisture in the soil for the crop. So I believe it's one way of mitigating buffering against climate change.